So, it's time for CLI 307, which means that you're here to listen about Map and Act. Um, Map and Act are a very simple tool. We're not going to cover, I mean, so everybody understands, we're not going to cover the deep uh, application compatibility toolkit digging uh, down in code and twist and bend. The only uh, person I know that can really show you how to do that is Chris Jackson, that's the app compat guy. Uh, I'm not sure. Is it in? You're not here, right, Chris? No? Thank God for that. Um, anyway, if you really want to dig down into ACT um, and see how you can bend and twist applications, it's Chris Jackson. We're going to cover ACT from another perspective. Um, but before we begin, just the basic information you need. Uh, my name is Michael. I live in Sweden. I do travel a lot. I do always deployment virtualization and other things that people pay me for. I actually had a customer ask me, do you do anything for money? I'm a consultant. It's the oldest work you can have. Um, I'm an MVP in setup and deployment, and I'm part of Step and MCDT. Um, but the, first of all, why do you really need this is something we're going to cover, and then we're going to go into deep, uh, do demos on, on Map and Act. I only have 19 slides, so this is going to be pretty much demos. And we need to figure out why. And here comes the, if I'm a consultant, this is very easy. As a consultant, I want to be sure that I don't mess up anything, I don't lie, and I will never get in any kind of trouble. That's safeguarding. Anybody works as a consultant and recognize that? I mean, never do anything that anybody can hold against you. Never. Can you just help me? Yeah, yeah, just push that button. You can push the button. No, no, you can push the button. I didn't push the button. I didn't do anything. That's one very simple reason. And I used both Map and Act to get facts so we can make decision based on something else than this, because most of the deployment scenarios I've been around uh, and seen, customers has made a decision based on hunches, and thoughts, and ideas. And two weeks ago, I was with a customer in Sweden, 13,000 machines. They decided to go for Windows 7 professional 32-bit. And I asked them, why are you going to do that? Well, we have decided we don't need the features in enterprise. And um, all the applications we have is 32-bit. And if we run 32-bit applications on a 64-bit platform, uh, the registry will be uh, very uh, messy to deal with. And you base that on what? Well, I saw a blog post a couple of years ago. Great. <laughs> so you're making a decision for an enterprise company based on something you saw a couple of years ago? Yeah, pretty much. It took me one hour to convince them to go for both 32 and 64-bit and do enterprise because they couldn't afford to do professional and buy the third-party encryption program that they needed. They missed the fact that BitLocker was an encryption application, so they were thinking of buying the third party instead. That's easy for consultants. So what about in-house? If I work for the company, then I don't have that problem. I'm hired help. I work there, right? What, what I've learned is this. Last summer, I was supposed to buy new things for our server rooms. I needed more blades, and more chassis, and, you know, fun things, right? Number one, try. I need more servers to expand the environment we have. The answer was no. 
Next try was we need to restructure our infrastructure to be cloud adopted. Approved. Same hardware, same stuff, same installation. I just throw in the word cloud and suddenly approved. Thank you so much. What you can get of map is reports that is business style. I don't care about business style reports. But obviously, CEOs tend to do that. So this is a converter from what you need into business language. So someone else can read that and say, yeah, this is a nice pie chart. Let's, let's invest in this pie chart thingy, whatever it is, right? So both consultants and in-house can benefit from using both MAP and ACT. We use them differently, though. So MAP 6.0 stands for Microsoft Assessment and Planning Toolkit. Um, the 6.0, it will increase in numbers for every major uh, new release of Windows and Office and Azure. There will be a new version of MAP to adopt to that platform. So right now, MAP 6.0 is matched to be a tool to discover things like Office 365 and Office 2010 and stuff. When, if there will be a new version of Windows, when the new version of Windows comes, it will be a new map version. Next version of Office, there will be another version of map. So this is a tool you use, and then you uninstall it. Except for the fact if you're being a consultant, then you have it on your laptop, and you inventory your customer's environment, so you have everything on your laptop. It gets the hardware, software, it gets overviews of everything. It generates reports. It does software tracking, which is kind of fun. Here's where you can see that most customers are paying more licenses for SharePoint than they actually use. It's the management that thinks people use SharePoint. We have 400 employees. We need 400 users license. And then you do a tracking and realize that it's only six people using SharePoint. That's the management and the SharePoint guy. However, they are under licensed for SQL because they have no clue on how SQL licensing works. So you can see all that. Basic security issues. Do they really have antivirus or not? Most companies think they have, and sometimes they really have that. Find databases. Here's, if you're into uh, doing migration of databases, you realize they, they, they say they have this amount of database servers, but when you do a scan, you realize that you have SQL servers all over the place. You have every version of SQL server ever invented, and then some. You also have Oracle, Sybase, and you know, this is, gonna, this is costing you money today. We could create a database hotel instead and put every database in that. Some customers, customers want to off, migrate to Office 365, and I want to see if that's possible, things like that. Um, it is a solution accelerator, which means it's totally free of cost, of course, uh, and it's agentless. The agentless is in most cases really nice, which means that we don't leave a footprint on the machines we do an inventory on. We never install anything on them at all. On the other hand, it means that they need to be live when you do an inventory of them. You need to be able to contact them, and we use WMI to do that. And WMI normally is not a problem, but here are some of the, uh, oops. Some customer turns off the server service to all the clients uh, for security reasons, because it's easier to turn off the server service than turn, off, turn on the firewall within Windows, because that's so messy. It's much better to turn off the server service. Then you can't 
remotely manage the machine at all. And I've seen that. Also, it uses WMI, a Windows XP machine that has been installed for like, I don't know, six or seven years ago, uh, never been you know, refreshed or reinstalled. In many cases, WMI had stopped working a couple of years ago. It just you know, blows up. It, it can be fixed, but if you have like 10,000 machines, I'm not sure you fix it on all of them. So there are scenarios and situations that, ah, the agentless doesn't really work because they have problems in the environment. We also have, of course, the I don't trust the Windows XP firewall. So we have another, the Norton, Norton antivirus firewall because that's much better. Someone told him. So let's do a demo of this instead. No, number two. There you go. It's only 64 important updates. Nothing fancy. I'm going to turn off TweetDeck too. Otherwise, we're going to have that in the face all the time. So, number one. It's not that hard to um, install it. You, uh, you just download it and install it and, and it will install a SQL database. It's going to install SQL Server 2008 R2 Express. If you don't want that, you can download and install the SQL Server 2008 R2 uh, database before. If you just name the database MAPS, M-A-P-S, it will use that database instead. It does have a couple of requirements. One of them being it needs the database, it needs to be local, and it also needs Microsoft Office because it's going to use Office to generate all the reports. And the reason why this doesn't start is because of me being stupid. Services. I don't have the maps database up and running all the time. I think that's the reason why. SQL Server, oh, there you go. Amazing. As you can see, you can have multiple databases. And in this case, I only have two. I have a sample database, and I have a test database called uh, Via Monstra. The sample database is very interesting because that is something you can download. I mean, you, be, to be able to play with this, you need some data, right? There is a map um, toolkit you can download uh, with the demo database. So you can install the demo database and play with it uh, if you don't have a couple of thousand machines. And that is the sample database. You can do backup, you can restore them, uh, you can export, you can import the databases if you like to do that. If you do this for customers, please have one database per customer, otherwise it's going to be nasty. As soon as it's installed, the only thing you do is that you do the inventory and, and assessment wizard. And now we tell the system what to look for. And it's a two-step process. Number one, what should I query for machine names? And number two is, what account will I use to attach to these machines and do the inventory? We can, um, we can inventory Linux-based machines, Windows. Do you know why they have the inventory for Linux-based machines? This is actually a customer requirement. But do you know why? Easy for a customer who would like to switch from Linux to Windows. That has to be a very common scenario, don't you think? Oh, we're running Linux on 10,000 machines. We would like to switch to, to Windows. Can you help us? Yes, absolutely. We just invent that. It's going to do an SSH connection to your Linux-based machines and do a hardware inventory using SSH. We can do VMware, Exchange, SQL, Windows Azure, and so on. 
In this case, I'm just going to do a Windows. And here's the next question. How? Should we query Active Directory? Should we, uh, should we browse the network? Should we, should we ask CCM? And here's a good question. Because when I talk about map and customer that has CCM, say, most often they say, we don't need map. I have CCM. And CCM has the same kind of reporting. Not even close. The reporting from CCM is very dry. And so am I. But it's very dry. It's just the facts. It doesn't give you the fancy pie charts. It doesn't give you graphics. And it doesn't explain why a customer should have Windows 7. And in this case, we don't use the data from CCM. We only use the names. Here's the machines I would like to inventory. Or you can scan an IP address or you can type in and so on. Nothing fancy. And in this case, I'm going to say, well, you do it for, uh, let's do one machine. And in that case, I need to provide an account so I can attach to that machine. Yeah. Is there a spelling training somewhere? And as you can see, the protocol is going to be used is WMI. If, if you have chosen like um, Linux, it would said SSH in, in a, together with VMI. And you do save. You can say you, you have a, a button called Save and New, which means that, and I've done this, you can inventory your work group of machines. The, the largest work group I ever seen was 545 machines in a work group. So you, so you didn't buy a domain controller. No, it was too expensive. Check. So everybody's a local admin. Yes. And now you want me to migrate 545 machines from your work into a, a domain. Yes. Mm. OK. Change customers. Anyway. And then you specify, uh, for this machine, I'm going to use this account. In this case, it's going to be the same account. Uh, at all times. And I'm not going to go through this because it takes a couple of minutes. When this is done, this machine is going to attach to the machine, do a WMI query. Now, most customers have something that blocks this. So if you want to do this at a customer or your own site, the first thing you should do is to Find someone that is responsible for group policies and create a group policy that opens up the necessary ports. And to do that, it's all in the document, but I'm going to show you anyway. Uh, the only thing you need to do is find group policy and create a policy called map policy, maybe. And now it's important. Because we had a customer, a couple of customers called me and said, you know, it doesn't work. So what did you do? I, I, well, I opened this. I went to policies. I went to Windows settings. And I did the security settings. And then I found the firewall. And then I opened the firewall. And, you know, well, it doesn't work for XP. Check. This is Vista and above. You can't use this. You need to go to Administrator Templates, Network, Network Connection, Windows Firewall, Domain Profile, and open two of them. Namely, Allow Inbound File and Print Sharing Enabled. And if you want to be really secure, you type in the IP address from the machine you're going to scan the network. If you're lazy, you make it simple, you type in the star, which means it's open for any IP address in that port. Inbound, you need, and you also need this one called inbound remote administration exception. Same story goes there, either the IP address or subnet you're scanning from, or a star for everything. Now, 
How long does this take to be implemented on machines? Very simple, it takes 90 minutes plus minus 30. I always calculate on at least three hours, which means that I fix this Monday morning at nine at customers and we do the first scan just before lunch. And then we will get hit most of the machines. When you've done that, you're pretty much done. Two things. Number one, the scan rate is about 10,000 machines per hour. If you have a scan rate that hits 10,000 machines in an hour, do you have any clue what's going to happen on the network? There's not going to be much traffic, but it's going to be a very unusual traffic pattern which means that if the customer is large and they do have network monitoring, someone will call you and ask you, what are you doing? To prevent that, give them a call before. Otherwise, if they do have security in place, your network adapter connection will be terminated. We had customer that says, well, no, don't tell the guys. Let's try and see if they do monitor the network. And in most cases, they claim they have some kind of network monitoring. They don't, because they never realized what we do. So it's not about the amount of traffic. It's just a traffic pattern that generates a very strange behavior. A laptop is now doing connection to 10,000 machines like that. So could be treated as a virus or something. The information you get back is very nice, though. Let's say that they, you are doing a Windows 7 upgrade or migration. Well, here's the question you have. Don't get satisfied with this. Remember to modify the set assessment properties. By default, this is different. It looks like this. That is the minimum system requirements for running Windows 7. Anybody tried the 32-bit machine running with one gig of RAM, Windows 7? It's a pretty old machine, right? With Office, Internet Explorer 9, and open Facebook, and just, you know, realize that the time is freezing right now. Nothing happens for at least five minutes. We have one, I always have one deal. And I say this, whomever, I don't care who, but whomever does this decision is forced to have this kind of machine during complete proof of concept or deployment. And if it goes out through a window, they're going to increase these numbers. Otherwise, he's going to be stuck with his computer forever. Uh, which means that you need to be realistic around this. Here's realistic numbers. You don't really care about the DVD and you don't really care about the um, video adapter. That is, that is reasonable. I wouldn't say it's perfect, but it's reasonable. Uh, the uh, CPU speed and the free disk space you don't need to care about it at all, because if you have, um, you're going to wipe the disks most likely or reinstall the operating system anyway. But if you have less than that, you don't have that much memory anyway. So it's a, it's a balance. So just focus on the memory, and you will be good to go. Now, if you then do a run assessment, maybe these pie chart will change. So the first glimpse you get, is the default values, you don't want to have that. Do a run assessment and get the real values, and then you have something to play with. And this gives me pretty much information. It gives me the overview. 10,000 machines in an hour takes at most two hours to do the uh, group policy thing, which means that from knowing absolutely nothing 
three hours, three hours later, I will most likely know as much as I need to know to say, well, this is the way this project is going to go. We are going for this and this, and we need to replace that hardware and blah, blah, blah. Then we have some numbers to play with. We can also have a discussion in a conference room, or four of them, or hundreds of discussions, and never find out anything at all. It also gives me this information. One of the most common discussions I have with customers is drivers. Well, we're not going to go for 64-bit uh, Windows 7 because, the, you know, we have driver issues. The hardware we have, blah, 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 blah. And everybody knows that the amount of drivers is a big issue. Yeah, only 98% of all the drivers are actually on the DD. Uh, in this case, I know that I need to call or I need to browse at five different websites to find a driver. Worst case, we need to buy five new scanners. Maybe they have a flatbed scanner. You remember the UMAX 630? Steam-powered things with a small nuclear power plant next to it. It doesn't work in Windows 7. It didn't work in XP either, but people still have them. It's like, yeah, buy new ones, throw the old ones. So it gives me the overview for this, too. But this is just the overview. What I really want is this, the reports. And here's a bunch of reports. You don't need them all. But as a consultant, I'm smart. I do the inventory for everything. We focus on Windows 7, but I prepare reports, because it only takes a couple of seconds to do them anyway, I prepare reports for related technologies, like maybe Office 2010 is going to be something you might want to have too, uh, or maybe you're having discussions around Office 365, or maybe virtual, you, you get the point, right? As a consultant, that means that I'm going to get another job. Yeah, let's do the virtualization stuff when we deploy Windows 7. Yeah, no problem. I can, you know, check my calendar immediately and book the time. Yeah, yeah, do that. Great. Fun thing is the security assessment that gives you a list of if they're running antivirus, if they do antivirus, uh, are they having a security center on or off? Yeah, basic security things. And it's always so funny to see these. Yes. We have an antivirus, it's centrally deployed, and every machine have that, except for the 45% that doesn't have that, but we think they have, which means that the process that the customer have this time doesn't work. The way they treat XP as a client doesn't work, which means that we can't really do the same way we always done before. We need to change the behavior for this platform we are changing into. But you see, you can get other information too. There are two kinds of documents you get. You get either Word documents or you get Excel spreadsheets. Word documents is something you print out and hand over to people that wears a tie and a jacket. The Excel spreadsheet is something you keep for yourself because they can't read it anyway. It's too complicated. I've already done this. I'm not going to do it next, next, next. Uh, when they are done, you will find them here. You save reports. And here's the fancy one. Let's pick up the Windows 7 proposals. And I actually had a customer ask me, is there any way I can get all the features in Windows 7 Enterprise explained so I understand? Yep. This is business explanation of the Windows 7 features. I don't understand what's in here, but they do, because this is just boring. But it, obviously, they, it makes sense. But they get this. Wow, a pie chart. From a business perspective, 
they see something in this picture that I don't understand. But from their perspective, it's, yes, this looks really good. Um, something, whatever it is. I prefer numbers. Man, there's numbers in here too, of course. Here you have the numbers. And you can see uh, the uh, number of machines that is ready for Windows 7, uh, machines that needs to be upgraded. Uh, so we can pretty fast do some kind of calculations. These amount of machines needs to have more memory. Um, these machines are maybe should be replaced. We can do on top of our heads a really fast calculation on how much is that going to cost and give the customer some information. You also get the operating system, device drivers, and you get application summary. Now the fun begins. Anybody done map on a large enterprise inventory? Did you get any games in the list? Most common game is so far is World of Warcraft. And if you, since I live in Europe, we, we have, still, Europe is still divided in, in, in the west and the east part, at least when it comes to software, because every computer in the east part has um, BitTorrent clients on them for some reason. They don't have it on the west side, but on the east side they do. It's very strange. When you show this for management, they're going to go ballistic. It's going to be like, oh, God, how can this be? Blah, 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 blah. So from customer to customer, it sometimes it happens to be, you know, problems and issues. And we need to pause the implementation um, for a day or two while they have internal discussions on how this could be like this. When that is over, I can come back. So, pretty decent reports. But most likely, if you want to build a deployment solution around this, you're going to need this information instead. The Windows, not assessment, uh, hardware and software summary. Uh, I think it's that. Yes, here's the hardware inventory. The fun thing here is that you're going to get most of the hardware information. I'm not saying every, but you're going to see things like the MAC address. The MAC address is very useful if you want to build a deployment solution if they don't have one and you want to populate a database with MAC addresses and combine that with names to be able to automate deployment. Here's the MAC address for every machine. Maybe you want to be able to build a driver library based on the models and here are the models. As you can see, all the models in here, because it's going to inventory that too. So I use this information to pre-populate deployment solutions, to do uh, pretty decent uh, analysis. And here's the fun thing. Every customer I have so far has always told me this. Uh, we are an HP shop. So you only have HP, yes. And then some others, like Dells and Lenovo's. And, okay. and, and you only run Windows, yes. Basically, we also have another couple of operating systems. And you run Office. Yes, everybody has Office 2003, or should have. I mean, oh, God, make decisions on that. We think we have something. How much does it cost? I don't know. This gives me the information. There are, of course, other reports, and you most likely get the point of having these. Uh, if you do servers, you have other things like this. Windows Server 2008 R2 readiness. Can we or can't we run Windows Server 2008 R2? Same story, set assessment properties, and define that. <laughs> yeah, if we have a machine with two gigs of RAM, that's going to be perfect R2 server. Not. If it doesn't have a DVD, <laughs> I don't care about DVDs. So you rearrange that. However, you need to be very sure that when you specify these numbers, it's physical machines. You're going to have virtual machines, and they have other numbers, of course, then we don't need to have 4 gigs of RAM because we can twist the amount of memory as needed. 
Same story here. What do they have? Oh, we only have Windows Server 2003, and then some drivers. Not so good. And this is true. It's, it's worse to get driver support for old servers to Windows Server 2008.2 than it's for Windows 7. It's a better driver support for Windows 7. Here we have 500, 573 unknown drivers. And we have the report for this. Other things, of course, you can see they have Windows Server 2008. They removed Vista. You used to have that in the old version, but nowadays nobody actually migrates to Vista. I wonder why. Strange. You can see the other things. Here's the one thing that is funny. Internet Explorer Discovery doesn't really tell you only if they do have Internet Explorer. It tells you that they do have other browsers. This tells me that if I'm going to implement something that is web-based, like SharePoint, it's not going to be very easy. I need to take care of all these browsers now. Because God knows if all those works. I mean, one guy is running Opera. Isn't that a show in the United States? Opera being for a show or something? And Safari is something else, right? And here you can see this nasty list. The list of all Internet Explorer add-ons that is used and installed all over the place. Some of these will be business applications, and, and, and you need to test them, and they need to be verified that they work. And some of them should be blocked and never, ever been installed once again. You need to take care about this, too. Tip of the day from Explorer Bar. Great. And you can see other things, too. Um, and Office is the same, of course. So for server, we have something else. And that is maybe we we'll want to implement Windows Server 2008 R2 and Hyper-V and do all that stuff. Well, a pretty common question is, if we are going to convert all these physical machines into virtual machines, how many host machines will we need? Will it work? Can it be virtualized? And since I've been doing this a couple of years, every person so far I've spoken with has, a, they made up their mind already from the beginning. They have a couple of servers, and here's the discussion. Well, we're not going to virtualize the SQL servers or the Exchange servers, uh, because you know they are under heavy load. It's impossible to virtualize those. Um, the rest we can virtualize. Are you sure? Yeah, 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 yeah. Everybody knows that. No discussions. Are you really sure? And then we start doing a measure. We measure the load on these machines. And the result is something else. Because what we get here is this. IOPS. Disk IO operations per second. And suddenly, it turns out to be the opposite around. The threat management gateway, or the ISA server, is the one that consumes most IOPS of every machine they have. Why? Well, it uses SQL Server database to log every packet that goes in and out. That is going to consume disk IO, trust me. But the Exchange server has no problem. The operation manager server is loaded like ugh. So by using this information, we can more or less say, well, you know, no, this machine is OK to virtualize. This, is, this requires new hardware. It's better to upgrade the operating system or something like that, or change from Exchange 2003 to Exchange 2010. So it gives me all that information. Tells me logical physical network processor on these machines, what they do consume and what's in them. So to calculate a virtualization, well, it's pretty much already done. 
They also thrown in a server consolidation result that says that here's the number of devices we discovered so far, and here's the host machines. And we think you could make all these machines go into these host machines to make this more consolidated than you had today. And you do that by creating hardware. There is a bunch of hardware, which this is Hyper-V host machines, or um, farms of Hyper-V host machines. So this is the call the fast track. So if you don't have time to design anything, you can pick a farm that is pre-manufactured and say, well, if we buy this, and we have this number of virtual machines, which machine goes, or physical machine, which physical machine goes onto what virtual host machine? How can we combine all this together? And it's a click, click, click wizard, and it gives you a nice fluffy report. If you don't want to do that, you can create your own hardware library and say, this is the kind of server I would like to buy. To be able to do that, we need to collect performance metrics. And that is something we can do after we do the inventory and assessment wizard. Then we run the performance and metric wizard, which is very simple. You point to the following servers and say, measure them. And here comes the trick. Uh, the, the least amount of time you're allowed to do this is two hours. And two hours is not enough to do any kind of decisions. I mean, you don't know if these machines were loaded during those two hours. So you need to do this inventory for at least two or three days. Otherwise, it's kind of pointless. If, if you're just you know, playing, two hours is fine. But in reality, it needs to measure these machines. And of course, the customer asks, is there going to be any impact on these servers while we measure them? Nope. We only redirect the performance logs from these servers to my machine. So yes, it's going to increase the network load with 0, 0, point, point, 0, 0, point, point something percentage like nothing. It's kilobytes that is transferred. Uh, there's also a Windows Azure TCO and ROI calculator uh, included in this, which is kind of fun to do. Because if you do this, you're going to realize that, well, we also discovered that you had a following web servers, and maybe those should be converted into Azure. If you want to do it, here's what we think. You have three applications with the following whatever it is, and it consumes that, and we think that that could go into the cloud in, in the following way. And then we can calculate on the cost they should have. What kind of subscription should you have? And so on and so on. Crazy. Um, there is another way of see data, and that is the inventory summary results. And you can say, well, you know, I want to see on connection status or operating system. Uh, and you can just play with numbers in this. Um, and it goes for products, too. Another thing that we have is software usage tracking. Um, now, this is not really, really simple to set up. It does require a couple of things. Number one, you need to configure your servers to generate log files meaning that you need to configure Windows Server, Active Directory, Exchange, SharePoint to generate log files. When do you do have the log files? You use log parser to uh, convert them, um, and you configure log parsers to do that for you, and then you parse the logs, and then you get some information. And here you can see, well, um, the date range is between blah, 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 and blah, 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 330 days. And we can specify and see what kind of version people are using of the different. Here's something we don't know anything about. Uh, let's go this, go to product instead, sorry. Uh, we do have five user that connects to Windows 2000 advanced server. Standard server, uh, you're professional, we have Windows server. This is what we have. And most likely, that's what we need as license, too. 
And you have the same story for SharePoint, all the SharePoint versions, SQL Exchange, and Operation Manager. So it doesn't give you, it's not a license inventory, right? It gives you numbers to just see, are we close or did we miss something? And most customers are paying for that license, but using that license instead. Um, I never set up software usage tracking in the beginning of a project. That is something that comes later on. I just do the inventory, generate reports, and get people into a conference room, and we can start having discussions on how to approach this little problem. That's pretty much about map. You get the picture? Some of you have used it. You, you tried it, right? What do you think of it? Is it okay or a bad application or worst ever? Or It's good? Anybody else tried it? What do you think of it? Yeah, I'll give you, yeah, I'll give you numbers, right? Anybody else tried it? Okay, you needed more access to be able to, okay. Yeah, you need local access to every machine. So when you do map, um, I mean, you're never gonna succeed the first time. Uh, I normally need to run this like three or four times. And there's no point of trying to get the 100% of all the machines. If you succeed to get more than 75 or 80, then you have enough information to make decisions because the rest of the machines, the other 25, will most likely fit into some category you already scanned. So the 100% will never happen, especially when you ask Active Directory because they haven't cleaned an, a, a computer account the last 45 years or 10 years or for never done it. I mean, isn't that scary when you come to, to a company that never cleans out account from Active Directory? They have dead people in, in Active Directory? He's deceased. He doesn't live anymore. Ugh. Don't touch it. <laughs> I think it's scary. They don't. I don't know why. So... Act 5.6. When we've done the map, uh, most likely we will start up some kind of migration project, uh, both for service and for clients, but we will most likely need more information about application. Customers have often very many applications. I usually add a zero in the end of whatever they say they have. We only have thousands. You mean ten thousands. And that's pretty close to what they have. And I want to see what they have. Um, we can use ACT for that. We can also use ACT to find incompatible uh, web applications. There's no point of testing external ones, but internal applications is nice to know if they work. Um, we can generate reports. We have a database where testers and devers can work together uh, on applications and we can make decisions on what to fix. We can do triage on all the applications, uh, which is pretty convenient. It, it's a toolkit. It's not a one-click start button. It's a toolkit. We have the compatibility administrator, which is the application where we have all the shim databases. Microsoft create a shim database for us. That's the system database and then we can create our own databases. We have the application compatibility manager, which is used to collect and do analysis of application. We have an Internet Explorer test tool, which is pretty nice. You just let someone you know, run that and say, hey, do whatever you do in that whatever application you use all the time. Oh, you mean the buff app? Yeah, whatever it is. Just browse and do the thing. 
And we do have the standard user analyzer, which we use. The setup analyzer tool is not used anymore, but the standard user analyzer tool, which we use to verify that application works. Now, when it comes to application, you need to be really smart. You need to, you need to do as little as possible. That's the trick, because you, you, can't, you can't possible test all the application. There's no way. I've seen all these charts where oh, we have 10,000 applications and we just hired 400 people to try them. You, you can't do that. You need to make decisions really fast and you need people that can help you. And ACT is, is a tool to get it faster up to speed. Oh, it's demo. Um, so so let's, buy, let's check first how do you collect data. Um, because that's the most important thing. We need to collect data. This is agent-based. It generates an MSI package. We need to install that MSI package. I don't care how. You can use group policy. You can use script, PSXEC. You can throw the MSI uh, file at people. You can put it on USB sticks. I don't really care. But you need to make one decision. Should you try this on each and every machine or just a few. Here's a couple of samples before I start a demo. So company A has made a decision. These are the applications that should be installed on the machines. If there are any other applications on these machines, we don't care. They don't need to inventory. They've already decided which applications that goes into each and every machine. So they don't do an inventory. Other companies say, we have four different divisions, and all these divisions have unique applications. How many computers do you need to inventory? Four. One for each department or division. There's no point of doing it for everyone. On the other hand, many and most companies have actually no clue on what's installed on each and every computer. So in that case, we would like to do some kind of inventory. And the trick is this. You start up the Microsoft Application Compatibility Manager, and it immediately shows up like this. And then you create. Oh, sorry. Thank you. There you go. Looks like this, and the first thing you do is to create a new package. By name, the click, new package, call it, I don't know, Invent Office 34. Now, there's one thing that is extremely important here. And I've seen customer doing this. And then they start doing an inventory. And if Chris Jackson was in this room, he will be very angry right now. That means that you're going to install an agent that every second hour will generate an inventory of all the applications and evaluators and upload that to a file share. Now the problem is that that's going to be an XML file. On the other side we're going to have a parser that parses the XML file and the parser they built is made in a way that it parses the file sequentially. That's going to take somewhere between five to six years to inventory if you have 10,000 machines, which means that most likely Windows 9 will be out at that time, and, and you still don't have all the data. And the reason is you need to do this twice. The first time you do an inventory, you just want to see what they have. And in that case, we're going to turn this off by going into advanced and deselect the evaluators. 
Evaluators is something that runs in the machine and evaluates if there are API used by application that doesn't exist in Windows 7 anymore. But you only need to do that on machines that you suspect have those applications. That's something we create another package at a later time and target just those machines. And we evaluate them for a week. We tell the user to fire up the old thingy you have and do whatever you're supposed to do with it. And, you know, let me know. If you unselect these, this has no impact. The um, MSI package will be installed, do an inventory, and uninstall itself in less than one minute and 40 seconds. Now we don't have an issue with the five-year database that it's going to be created. Another good tip is label those. Don't do an inventory package for the whole company. Create one package per department, per division, per, per something. Because when you do app compat testing, you will realize that you actually tested all the application for the department across the street. And suddenly, that department is ready for a Windows 7 deployment. And that's a good pilot. Everything works. We don't have an issue. Let's start with them. So otherwise, you're not going to really see the different departments. It's possible, but it's uh, kind of tricky. You do a save. You save it somewhere. And then you distribute the package. You install the package. And when it's distributed and installed, you can flip to status. And then you can see that a package is being installed and scheduled and run and uninstalled. And you can even see the time for that. When you've done that, you can flip over to Analyze. And Analyze will give you information. And the first thing you can do is get rid of the Vista and XP, because you don't really need to see that. It's good enough to have the Windows 7. And you're going to be presented with an enormous list of applications. One normal computer that has nothing else but Windows, Office, and Internet Explorer, and is at least two years, have around 140 to 150 apps all kinds of applications, because this sees every application, including the driver application and, and small utilities we have. And now the fun begins. You need to find someone that can make decisions. What applications are we going to have? Which one is supported? Who is the owner behind Acrobat Reader? Someone needs to pay to test Acrobat Reader. Someone needs to be responsible for each and every application. And then someone needs to pay you for testing these applications. So in companies with less than 5,000 people, we try to find these guys and lock them into a room. Joan is normally standing outside and holding the door until some decision has been made. So how long does it take? Well, last time we did this, they had 5,500 applications somewhere. It took us two hours to come down to 200. I think that's OK. 200 applications. What they did was this. Do we need that? <laughs> yes or no? Well, we need Acrobat Adobe Air because we use TweetDeck, and that is the business application. So someone says, it's a business application. It's business critical. Do we need Adobe Reader? Yes, it's business critical. Do, that's a driver. Do, we don't care about the driver. It's going to be replaced by another driver anyway. Do, do we need Google Toolbar? No, we 
We don't need that. Google updater, no, it goes for the same. You go through the list. When you're done, flip the filter and say, priority, business critical, reload, and you will be giving a list of the application that is really required. Now, the only thing you need to do now is this. Send and receive. which will take the list, if everything works, and compare that with other customers and other vendors, or their vendors, and give you back information on if this application works or not. Now, here's pretty easy. Adobe Reader X works. It works because the vendor has specified it's supported in Windows 7. Do I need to test this? No. This is already tested. This goes directly to the proof of concept. Bang! A subject matter expert might need to test it or, or a pilot needs to test it. It's more about how to package the application. It works. It's done. Next application, Adobe Air. Hmm, Adobe Air is not supported from the vendor. However, twenty-one other customers around the globe has defined this application to work perfectly fine, and no one has any issues. Do you need to test this? No. It's already tested into the pilot. You don't test application that everybody else says it works. You just package them, and then you test them in the pilot, because you need to do that, right? Then you're going to have a bunch of application that doesn't work. Instead of green, it's going to be ugly red. Do you need to test the application that doesn't work? No, they don't work. Nobody else has even made them work slightly. You don't test them either. You're going to have a bunch of yellow ones. It says, well, you know, it kind of works, but we have issues with it. Read the issues. Most likely, there's a new version of the same application that does work. So the only application we test is the application that nobody knows anything about which means that if 5,500 apps turns into 200 apps, turns into 35 application that someone really needs to test. That's how you do this. Otherwise, you're going to be oh, stuck in application testing forever, locked in a room with a headset, playing Mozart for 10 hours a day. You're going to be crazy, and it's just boring. So this is the only way we figured out how to do this. This is also very fast. I mean, it takes the time it takes to deploy the package. Fine, right? But then it takes about, I don't know, two or three minutes for every machine to report back. It takes a couple of hours. And then you have the complete database with all the applications. As a tester, you can, of course, test this application, and you, you can tell other people and, and your own company, this is the issue we have, and here's the application properties, and here's the machine they're installed to, and, and you can, of course, flag them and say, well, you know, that application is ready to deploy. And this application is ready to deploy. And now we can create reports and say, can you, can you create a report on Office 44 across the street and see if they have any applications that is not ready for deploy. No, they have none. Everyone is ready for deploy. Perfect. We have the pilot. Let's deploy Windows 7 with applications. You can do the same thing for servers. 
However, the information that Microsoft provides globally is not that rich for servers. Uh, but for servers, application is not the biggest issue anyway. If you come across the fact that you need to test applications, an application doesn't work, you can you, you, need to, you need to figure out a strategy how to, to run these applications. Let's say that the company has decided that application, whatever it is, is business critical. If we can't this, make this application work, it's going to be a blocking issue. How to fix that? Well, we can do virtual XP mode. Oh. No, please, don't try that. Uh, we, can, we can use App V. It won't solve application compatibility with the operating system. AppV solves problem between applications, not the OS. AppV goes away. MedV goes away. Maybe we can run it as a uh, published application in a terminal server. Uh, that works. We can upgrade to a new version. Yep, good choice. But we could also shim the application. Shimming the application is making the application work even if it doesn't really want to work. Now, there is one issue with shimming application. And before you even start doing that, you need to ask yourself or the customer, how important is support for this application? Because if support for the application is crucial, there is no point of shimming it since it's not supported on Windows 7 or Windows Server anyway, there's no point of making it work. Be, hey, it works. Yeah, but we don't support it. But it works really good. Yeah, but we don't support it. Huh? If the vendor doesn't support it, don't spend time on shimming it. If support is important. In many cases, the customers say, we don't care about support because we don't pay for support anyway, so it doesn't really matter. OK, in that case, shim it, fix it, and run it. So how do you do that? Well, it's not that hard. You take your Windows 7 machine, you install it, basic, standard, you install ACT, and you install something called App Verifier. You need to have the application verifier. There's one for 32-bit and one for 64-bit. Install that. And then you download the application. I have the application here. Here's just boring apps, nothing fancy at all. They are fast. And let's start by doing this. I'm going to disconnect from this machine and connect as, oh, sorry, I'm going to connect to this server first. And then we start installing the application. And we install it as a usual application, nothing fancy at all. Next, 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 next. The application is installed. OK. So should I test this application as a local admin, or should I test it as a user? As a user, right? So let's flip over to that machine and do this instead. Log on. And add a user. And let's go for Mike. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Install. He's already responded, okay? This is like having a discussion with my wife. She's not here, and so it doesn't matter. But pretty much that. Takes a while. <laughs> uh, 
Okay, so the application is somewhere around here. Um, before I just fire it up, I'm going to do this. I'm going to go in here and run the... There's two ways. Either you can use the standard user analyzer or the standard user analyzer wizard. Uh, it depends on how you want to work, but this is the wizard. Tum, 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 tum. Browse for application. Uh, let's find that application. It's in the machine somewhere. Program files. Uh, most likely to be, oh, there it is, XML notepad. Fire up that. You, you could add parameters if, if that is needed for this application. You launch it. You need to elevate yourself to fire up the sandbox. And it's going to check that you have application verifier installed. And it's going to be angry and force you to download that. And then you play with the application and, you know, you do stuff with the app. Things that is supposed to be done, whatever it is, done. It waits for the application to exit and says, well, did it work or did it not work? Well, did, this one did really work, but I'm going to say no instead. And then it tells me that maybe these are the issues. These are the issues we discovered that could be issues. It tries to write different locations. He's trying to do things, and maybe we should correct the file paths. And, and then I can try the application again. First needs to start before you can exit, though. And I do whatever I do, and then I close it, and then it's going to ask me, was this a good thing? Yes, it works. Okay, then I can export this. And that's going to give me what? An MSI file. That's an MSI file that corrects these things in this application. So you deploy the application, and you deploy the MSI file, which contains all the fixes. And now this application works. Suddenly, it just works. This is one way of doing it. This works when you have a few applications. If you have many, don't do this. Instead, you fire up this one. The standard user analyzer. It's pretty much the same thing. However, gives you other options. And one of them is to export everything in the database. Sorry. XML notepad. Fire up, no parameters, launch, yes, blah, 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 blah. Now we can see fire that up, do whatever we're supposed to do. It gives me file. It would like to create directory. Doesn't work with virtualization. Maybe we can say that's noise, but it could be a real problem. We can see registry things it, it's going to do, namespaces, it's contacting, and other objects and things like that. Now we have the mediation. We have export as MSI, but since I know what's happening here, I can take this information and then I can create this in another way as a database file. Uh, there you go. Pick up the compatibility. Ah, sorry. Administrator for 32 bit. Here we can create database fixes. So I can create an application fix called fix for the application vendor of Mic, point to the whatever application it is. For instance, this horrible application written by Chris Jackson. And then I can say, well, if we run this application, it should have the following. Here's one very simple thing. 
Uh, Rick, I was going to say admin. Admin. Uh, require. Yeah, run as admin. You know what run as admin actually does? Here's a very common problem. You, you run an application that is an XP application in Windows 7, right? That's going to be virtualized. The application itself becomes virtualized because it lacks the manifest of a Windows 7 machine, which means that if the application is really bad, it tries to write in the H key uh, local machine, and it tries to write in System 32 and you know, locations where it shouldn't be able to write. However, since it's an XP application that lacks the manifest, the virtualization system in Windows allows the application. So the app really works. However, it checks if you're a local admin. So the app blows up and says, you're not a member of the local admin group. Yes, you are. Because that's just going to reply to the application. Is he in local admin? Absolutely. He's also God. He's the queen. He's the king. Whatever you like. He's whatever. It's just, you know, you type it in. Here's the reply I would like to have back. And you can do this. You see that you have a bunch of, you have 366 fixes for basically everything. If you do have an application that doesn't work, I recommend that you try to challenge Chris Jackson and says, it's impossible to make this application work. He's good in, in, in accepting challenging challenges. He's never lost so far. Everything can be made so it actually works. You just need to figure it out. And then you have the recognition of the file and done, right? So I fix this. Then what? Well, it, then it becomes easy. You save this database. Uh, save this, call it app fix. And I know I'm almost over time. And you call it app fix.sdb. Gives you a database. In the deployment solution, you install that file. You install that using instdb.exe space file name. And then you have a fix for this application. So it can be done uh, if you really want to do this. So this is the reason to use Map and Act. Um, and by that, I'm way overdue, as usual. Questions? I will do questions on the floor here directly after you know that you can win a mouse and you can download a code reader and please fill out the evaluation forms. Uh, they are really needed. It's kind of funny. Uh, 200 people come to a session and four people fill out the evaluation because everybody thinks that, yeah, yeah, yeah everybody else is going to do that anyway. Uh, and I really need those. Thank you for coming. If you do have questions, come forward and I will help you as best as I can. Thank you for coming.